Ready? I am. The House Government Operations Committee will come to order, please, for Monday, April the 1st. Clerk, please take the roll. Representatives Bolso. Carr, Chisholm, Clemens, Crawford, Eldridge, Faison, Hakeem, Helton Haynes, Hammer, Johnson, Jones, Keesling, Kumar, Lafferty, Littleton, Marsh, McCalman, Rudder, Vice Chairman Reedy, Chairman Reagan. Here. Mr. Chairman, you have a quorum. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Members, do we have personal orders? Seeing none. We're going to have a slight alteration in our calendar. Item number two it will be taken up first. The sponsor has an appointment it's got to make. So please come forward, Representative Gant. And we have a motion and a second for a positive recommendation on House Bill 2528. You're recognized, sir. Mr. Chairman, how detailed do you want me to be? That's entirely up to you. you got to convince the committee, sir. All right. Thank you, Chairman and committee. And I feel this is a very important uh, bill that will take a step in the right direction to protect our children at school with all the uncertainty we face in this world. You know, our children are, are our future and our assets to the future. And uh, this bill adds um, what I feel is a very important safety measure to protecting our students while at school. And this bill establishes a mobile panic alarm pilot program. And we're hoping to institute this this year uh, it'll have 60,000 initially, and hopefully next year we can expand this program to include much more money for other schools across the state. But it will be administered by the Department of Education. The 
pilot program aims to provide grants to local education agencies, public charter schools, private schools, and other church-related schools to offset the cost of mobile panic alert systems. The systems must be approved by the Department of Education in consultation with the Department of Safety. The grants will be available for schools across the state. Equal consideration will be given to each grant division. No single grant can be larger than 10,000 per school. Grants will be distributed on a first come first serve basis. The Commissioner of Education will create rules to implement the program. The Department of Education is required to submit annual reports to the General Assembly detailing fund receipts and payments. And I won't belabor the point because uh, many of you probably have already heard this, um, but I, I do want to describe what a mobile panic alarm system looks like. And the mobile panic alarms are wearable devices like a badge that remain with a teacher or staff member at all times uh, while on the campus of the school. Mobile panic alarms summon help for medical incidents, uh, intruders, fights, um, other everyday disruptions. Uh, they can also lock down a school immediately and initiate and immediately initiate a response from first responders in the event of in many situations we see of school shootings or other critical emergencies. Uh, these systems differentiate between types of emergencies, clearly communicate the need for a lockdown, evacuation, or other response. And Mr. Chairman and committee, the, the fascinating thing about this technology is the moment uh, an intruder comes into that school um, and somebody hits that badge, it immediately notifies every teacher at their desk. Every uh, student is, a notify, is notified in, in most of these systems, and it immediately lets them know exactly what type of call is coming in. Because if it is, say, a um, you know, a fire alarm, we're all, we're all going to know what that is. But if, if it's an active shooter situation, it immediately notifies those students that could be in the hallway where they, that they immediately need to take you know, cover and it lets those teachers immediately know that they need to lock down that classroom. So as we know in these situations, seconds are critical in saving lives. And it also, one of the other fascinating things that it does is it notifies the closest law enforcement officer to that proximity to that school. It allows him to pull up a schematic map of the school and see exactly where from a pinpoint situation where that call came in. Uh, whether it's in a classroom, whether it's in the gymnasium, or what have you. They also can pull up live cameras inside that school to see what entry point would be the safest um, and most effective way to enter that school in that situation. So there's a lot more that I can go into about these type systems that I hope we can pass this year and hopefully put more money towards this for other schools as we go into the future. Now I'll, I'll try to answer any questions that members may have. Members, you've heard an explanation of the bill. Do we have questions of the sponsor? Representative Hakeem, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a couple of brief questions. Uh, this would not be installed in one grand division before it moves into other grand divisions. If I'm understanding correctly, I, I don't know if the proper term would be first come, first serve. Would you're be, you're recognized, be, Mr. Sponsor. Yeah, the way, the way it will roll out is each grand division will have two opportunities for this uh, grant. And two schools inside of those uh, grand divisions will be able to uh, qualify for these grants, if, if that answers your question. Okay. Follow up, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, now, I believe you spoke of, I'm going to call it a badge that someone uh, push a button or whatever. Is that like an administrator or would, each person in the school, um, you know, like teachers, would each of them have such a button? Or what's that process? Yeah, most of the custodial staff, the the teachers, the the principal, assistant principals, all the leadership will have these badges that will immediately in, initi initiate a response as to what type of response is needed, whether it's medical, active shooter, a fight you know, medical, you know, what have you. So it will initiate that response. And what's what's really unique about this these type systems 
is it goes out to every person's cell phone. It goes out to their desktops, that the teachers may be in the classroom. Um, it immediately notifies everybody, no matter where they're at, as to what just happened. And upon that immediate notification, hopefully they can take the proper steps to, to save these um, students' lives. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. Representative Jones, you're recognized. Thank you. Um, to the sponsor, you know, I agree with your initial statements that there's nothing more precious than our children. We need to protect our children. But I kind of feel like I'm in Groundhog's Day in this committee where we keep bringing policies that address, address the symptoms but not the root causes. You said, you know, we want to address things like gun violence. And so we're gonna, now we're going to create a button for people to press as opposed to addressing the root cause of what is causing schools to go into lockdown. We were in this committee not too long ago. We voted about creating a school safety plan. Then we voted against having fire alarm checks. Then we voted to say we're going to have bullet, you know, bulletproof glass. I mean, all these things that are dealing with symptoms, but nothing addressing the root cause. And so it's a bit frustrating, I think, for a lot of Tennesseans that we keep having these, these ideas. I'm not against your idea, but I just, I just don't understand why we can't address the root cause and we just continue on to, to address symptoms. Can you explain, you know, your thoughts on this? You're recognized, Mr. Sponsor. Uh, thank you, Chairman and and uh, member. Um, you know, you're really outside the scope of what this legislation is trying to target. I mean, we're trying to target the safety as a response to an incident that you just described, an active shooter. Uh, this does not in any kind of way affect gun laws in this school. This is a reaction, and hopefully we can be proactive with this measure uh, in that situation where somebody does come on a school campus uh, with a gun and they're, you know, taking lives of our children. Follow up, sir. That's the issue, Representative Gann. It's, it's a reaction. We're being reactive as opposed to proactive to stop gun violence. And so, you know, we're going to have buttons. We're going we're gonna to get, we're going to spend money to have buttons for people to press. Representative Jones, please direct your question on the bill. I was waiting for the, the sponsor to turn around um, so I can finish. I had somebody was making a no, noise here asking me a question. I, I didn't. I, were you no, making? I wasn't asking a question. Okay. You were saying. Um, that. I said yes. I agree. I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. I, Members, please refrain from interrupting. Uh, you're, you're recognized to respond to the question, sir. I didn't get to finish the question. Please finish your question. And so you're saying that, you know, this is reactive. At what point do we get proactive to addressing these crises instead of continually trying to create Band-Aids for something that needs a Representative deeper? Jones, please on the bill. This is, Th this is about the bill. This is about the bill. Uh, sir, this bill is about a response system. This is about the bill. Thank you. And so at what point are we going to get proactive? And, and, and do we have ideas that we can work in tandem with this button? Because I, I, Representative I Jones, I don't yield to you. And so the question. The, Next on my list is Representative Balso. Thank I, you, I did Mr. not Chairman. yield. I did not yield my time. You don't, sir, you don't get to yield your time. If you want me to rule you out of order, I will. That'll have consequences. Sir, you have a gavel. You don't have a whip. You're out of order, sir. It's not going to happen today. You are out of order, you, sir. You can hit the gavel. You can hit the gavel, John. You, you we'll stand in brief recess.
The committee will come back to order. Next on the list is Representative Bolso. You're recognized, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Leader Gant, thank you for your presentation. I wanted to focus on one of the statements that you made. If I understood your presentation correctly, uh, you mentioned that the panic alert button would actually alert the closest law enforcement officer such that the step of going through 911 would be eliminated. Is that correct? Mr. Chairman, am I? I'm sorry, sir, you recognized? Okay. Uh, I think they will take place at the same time. Di different systems react differently, and um, it will obviously be a call that goes out to 911, uh, but also this system will work simultaneously with that same response to a situation that may arise at a school. Follow up, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Leader Gant. Next on the list is Representative Johnson. You're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so I have a question. May seem, does it also include cafeteria workers? You're recognized, sir. Some systems are different. It just depends on how the school sets it up on who they want to have those badges. Um, some, some schools have everybody, including students, with a certain type of response, and some only uh, equip teachers, custodial administration with those badges. It just depends on the type system. Okay. Uh, oh, the, follow up. It, it seems weird, but the reason I ask this question is typically with a cafeteria, you have people bringing in, you know, in through the back, through the cafeteria, bringing in food and, and that sort of thing. So it's a particularly um, vulnerable spot. And um, I think it would be well served if they also had those as well, because it's an entry point that a lot of people don't think about covering. So um, again, and, and it's, this is definitely a, a reactive way to do this, but um, it uh, sounds like um, potentially something that could be helpful. Mr. Sponsor, any comment? No, sir. Next on the list, Representative Martin. The previous question, I'll hear a second. Okay, is there any objection? Seeing no objection, we're voting on sending House Bill 2528 to finance ways and means. All in favor, indicate, say, indicate by saying aye. aye. All opposed, nay. Ayes have it. Bill moves out to finance ways and means. We are back chairman. in regular order now, ladies and gentlemen. We're on House Bill 1. Uh, I'm sorry, item number one, House Bill 2922, uh, being presented by Representative Slater. You're recognized, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you. We have a motion uh, and a second. Thank you, committee. Uh, HB 2922 will establish opportunity charter schools. These public schools will serve eligible students <laughs> who have been historically underserved. Let me start by listing the students these non-traditional public schools will serve, and you'll find uh, these listed in section number one of the bill. Uh, first of all, students that have dropped out of school. Secondly, students who have been or are waiting on adjudication as a juvenile delinquent. Three, students who have previously been in a juvenile detention center. Uh, number four, students who have been repeated, who have repeated two or more grades before high school or are a year or more behind in high school. Uh, fifthly, students who are chronically absent. Uh, six, uh, students who are parenting. Uh, item number seven, students with documented substance abuse. And lastly, students who have experienced circumstances of abuse or neglect. For these students to be successful, there must be some latitude for the schools that serve them to be assessed based on the unique circumstances of this student population. This does not mean that expectations are lowered for these students. It means that metrics are developed for the opportunity schools so they are not quickly deemed to be failing while making progress with this unique student group. So what are the characteristics of an opportunity charter school? Uh, first, an opportunity school can enroll students from any district and the local funding will follow the student. It requires the Department of Education to develop an alternative accountability framework for state accountability and local charter school evaluation. Also this bill, like any charter school, the school must first apply to the district but may appeal to the charter school commission. Opportunity schools will only be eligible to operate as middle or high schools. And then lastly, opportunity schools must serve a minimum of 75% of the eligible students that we referenced earlier. The state board will be tasked with monitoring enrollment 
And if an opportunity school does not meet these eligibility requirements for three years in a row, then they must apply to amend their application or voluntarily close. And with that explanation, I stand ready for questions. Thank you, Mr. Sponsor. Uh, first on my list is Representative Johnson. You're recognized. This, um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've never seen so many red flags on, on a bill. This might be the second worst bill I've seen this session. My many concerns here. My first thought is when I see that this bill under, it undermines parent parental involvement. This is going to be, um, typically charter schools are required to have a parent on the board. This does not require and actually takes away the requirement for a parent to be on the board. So there's no answering to parents for this. It's not under the school board, it's under their own board. Why did you remove the parent from the board? You recognize Mr. Sponsor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your question. Uh, first of all, I'd, I'd state that these are schools of choice. So parents are the ones who choose to send their children to opportunity schools. As to your specific question, uh, given the nature and the characteristics of the student population, there may be some circumstances when in opportunity schools, there aren't parents that are readily available to be involved. And so, yes, it does allow an opportunity school not to have a parent on the board. It, that's not a requirement. So parents can be on the board. Um, but one of the characteristics is if, a, if a, a students have been abused, and we certainly wouldn't want parents on a board uh, when there are children who perhaps have been abused. And so this is a very uh, specific type of school. It's a school of choice that parents choose. And uh, so parents will be involved certainly in that way. Follow up. Well, I find it very concerning that it's not required to have a parent on the board. In addition, um, we're seeing all different kinds of groups together. It could be a school for uh, people who are awaiting a, you know, criminal charges or their trial. It could be for people who are um, abused. It could be for people, uh, a girl who is pregnant. I'm not sure that all these different groups of people, that there is one spot for these folks to be. Can you tell me what type of mental health and counseling services these schools will have? You recognize, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And you are correct that there are different uh, eligibility requirements. And opportunity schools will have uh, students in them from a lot of different, often difficult uh, circumstances. These are public schools. And so the same um, uh, opportunities uh, or the same mental health experts and supports that are available to any other public school are available to opportunity schools as well. Representative Clemens, you're recognized. I have one more follow up. L let me come back to you. We'll spread it around. Uh, you recognize Representative Clemens. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. How are you funding this, the mental health issues? You recognize Mr. Sponsor? Well, there would be no difference in the funding for mental health uh, support than there would be in any other public school in the state of Tennessee. Follow up, sir. Yeah, I'm not sure we, don't, we, we, we actually do that. So you, want, you care to elaborate on that? You recognize Mr. Sponsor? Well, uh, as it relates to uh, mental health, um, uh, this is a unique student population. Um, when we have unique schools in Tennessee, for example, the school for the blind or the school for the deaf, uh, we fund those schools and those unique uh, needs in the framework that we already have uh, in place here in Tennessee, including the TISA formula. So uh, those are also governed by um, the IEP process, and I, I don't necessarily see that in here. But let me let me get back to the it, couple of issues I have here. I, I I continue to be amazed at how we found ways to steer taxpayer dollars into private hands, and yet another one is before us. Um, tell me about um, this is year round, 
It can be year-round. You're talking about high-risk individuals. So how is this different than an institution or juvenile detention facility? I mean, wh where's the educational component here? You recognize, Mr. Sponsor? Well, these are schools. The, these are not institutions. These are not juvenile detention facilities. Uh, these are schools and uh, state standards. Uh, the, the educational state standards are still required. Um, the uh, academic accountability measures that we have uh, for um, schools, any public school in the state, still apply here. So um, these are schools. These are, these are not uh, holding places or detention centers. Uh, hang on, sir. I'm going back to Representative Johnson. I'll come back to you. So that's that's the tricky part for me. There's no fiscal note with this bill, but you mentioned uh, Tennessee School for the Blind or Tennessee School for the Deaf. We're talking about $160,000 per student to spend a year. Where's the fiscal note on that? You recognize, sir? Well, I'm not the one that does fiscal review, uh, but this school will be funded in the same way that other public schools are in the state of Tennessee. It's a public school. Last follow-up, ma'am. But it's a public school that is serving people who need counseling specifically because they need these extra wraparound services that they are not going to get if it's coming straight out of public school funding. It's not going to happen. How are we benefiting these students at all? Recognize, Mr. Sponsor. So by its very nature, opportunity schools are put into place or would be put into place so that we can serve the unique needs of these individuals. Then where's the money coming from? Uh, and wait, just, just, just a second. Please be recognized. Yes, sir. Uh, Representative Clemens, you had a follow-up, sir. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I, I'm curious about um, this has a whole application process and a timely application requirement. If the child is in state custody, who's filling that application out? Are, are, is the state going to take children in DCS custody and stick them in these so-called opportunity yes, charter sir. schools? You recognize Mr. Sponsor? No, that's not the intention of opportunity schools. The intention of opportunity schools is that there is a place that parents can choose to send their uh, children if kids. they fall into one of the categories that are listed in the legislation. But if the, the child falls into that category and they're in state custody, what's going on? Representative Clemens, please be recognized before you speak. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Am I recognized? You're recognized now, sir. Thank you. I appreciate it. What's going to happen to these children who fall into these categories that are in state custody? DCS going to just send these all these kids into this opportunity charter school and funnel more money out of our public schools? Uh, from through TISA because TISA is mandated in this. The TISA funding is mandated to follow the student in this, even across county lines outside the school district. So I'm really concerned again to my colleague's question about a how are we paying for this? B we only apportion enough money for children during the school year. Now we've got private operated year round schools for high risk children who may or may not be st stuck in these schools because they're in state custody. What's your question, sir? What the hell are we doing? I mean, wh where is the benefit to this type of program and how are taxpayer dollars going to be accounted for? Mr. Sponsor, you recognize? Make sure your mic's on, sir. It is, yes. Uh, in answer to your question, I think that the bill explains what it is that we're trying to do and how we're going to accomplish it. The This is an opportunity uh, for students, for parents to choose a, a school for their son or daughter who's had some difficulty previously, this is an opportunity for us to serve them well. Chairman Reedy, you recognize us? Uh, stand by one here. Uh, before I recognize you, sir, we have some people who have signed up to speak on this bill. Is there an objection going out of uh, session? Four, Here's seven, the uh, four, witnesses. Four. Seeing none. We're out of session. Uh, I have on my list to speak. Uh, Ms. Jasmine Miller, Zoe Jamail, and Hayden Pendergrass. Would you come forward, please? Okay, when you get uh, seated and prepared there, turn your mics on. You'll have three minutes. 
please give us your name and your who you represent. Uh, Ms. Miller, you're recognized first. Thank you. My name is Jasmine Miller and I'm a staff attorney at Youth Law Center. My primary area of expertise is education rights for youth in foster care and juvenile justice systems about which I have a presented on the national, state and local levels. While I wholly support efforts to improve education for these and all youth, I'm concerned that HB 2922 by establishing residential schools for at-risk youth will undermine the number one most important intervention for Tennessee's young people, quality parenting. And I do want to state specifically that in the bill it says that an opportunity charter school can be a residential program for enrolled students, a residential year-round program. Um, so this bill undermines parental involvement in their children's education by creating year-round residential programs and specifically stating that these schools, unlike all other charter schools, do not have to allow parents to participate in school governance. This bill undermines the state's responsibility to ensure that youth in foster care are placed in families, not in long-term institutional settings. I will point out that last year, the version of this legislation that ran, there was a lot of talk from the sponsors about how this was about DCS custody and providing a place for children in DCS custody to to be. Um, and so the state cannot and should not be in the business of replacing families with schools, and it will not solve the core issues affecting placement dif difficulties for youth in DCS custody. DCS has repeatedly claimed that the youth that is having the hardest time placing are youth with significant mental and behavioral health needs, medically fragile youth, and youth with other disabilities. And so shunting these youth over into a residential charter school, which is not required to meet the same federal and state standards as residential mental health placements and has no obligation or real ability to offer high quality community-based mental health services will not produce positive results. Um, on fiscal issues, the state has not appropriated the funding that would be necessary to ensure basic provisions of services in a residential school setting. Residential charter boarding schools are few and far between in the United States, but those that do exist report per pupil spending of $60,000 to $80,000 per student. I'd like to close by reading an excerpt from an op-ed in the Tennessee Conservative about last year's version of this bill. And it says, yes, school choice deserves our support, but HG 1214, which was last year's version of this legislation, creates bad choices and opens the door to coercion, but not freedom. These few pages of legislation could impact families and communities across the state. If the bill passes, we will find ourselves with an array of unwanted choices. These bills and any later attempts to revive their ideas must be voted down in their entirety. Their passage would affect current charter schools, family rights, infringement on local self-government funding, quandaries, and civil liberties if the state designates your children at risk, all while centralizing body uh, power in an unelected body. Your, your time body. is running out. Please finish. Yes. The boarding school for at-risk children aged 6 through 12, according to the Tennessee Conservative, is a bad choice because it leaves open multiple dangerous questions about how at-risk is defined. Could the state define your child at risk um, because it disagrees with the worldview you teach your children, the medical therapies you choose for them, or the political views you hold? Um, again, that is... Your, your time has expired. Uh, we're going to recognize Ms. Jamail, and we'll hold questions from the committee until we get everybody on board. Ms. Jamail, you're recognized. Please um, give us your name and, and who you represent. Uh, Zoe Jamail. I'm with Disability Rights Tennessee. Thank you for having me today. HB 2922 creates a new type of congregate setting that we are concerned could lead to the unnecessary segregation of young people with disabilities in residential facilities. While disability is not expressly included as a qualifier for the proposed residential schools for at-risk youth, disability intersects with many of the enrollment categories. Last year's version of this bill, HB 1214, did include disability as an enrollment category, and that bill was offered by its then sponsor in part as a solution to highly publicized placement issues within the Department of Children's Services. This one seems to do the same, offering a new type of institutionalization amidst a post-pandemic influx in the number of young children with intellectual and developmental disabilities coming into foster care. As noted by the commissioner of DIDD, more youth with autism are coming into DCS custody, not due to abuse or neglect, but rather because their parents cannot access spectrum supports in their communities. DCS admittedly struggles to place so-called high needs youth in traditional foster homes. To the extent these schools are proposed as a solution to DCS adequately serving the youth in their custody, we would offer that children having contact with the Department of Children's Services need families and services, not placement in residential facilities. And those families, be they biological parents, kinship or relative caregivers, or foster families, need supports in the community that enable them to keep their children in their homes. 
The bill would allow children as young as 11 to be separated from their families and communities and sent across the state for enrollment in residential opportunity charter schools. But what kind of opportunity truly exists for a young person who is deprived of family and connection to community? This bill raises more questions than it answers. While some of those questions may ultimately be addressed through rulemaking, illuminating certain details at this stage of the process is paramount to ensuring the safety and welfare of young people who may be enrolled. And it is also important when it comes to identifying how special education, behavioral, and mental health services will be funded and provided in this context. It is also important to consider how enrollment of students in these schools will impact the availability of limited resources in our public schools, as TESA's formula allows more funding for lower income youth and other at-risk categories, and those funds will follow youth who are enrolled in these residential charters. This type of setting does not yet exist in this state, and yet the bill says nothing about which entity will have licensing authority and provide oversight and accountability. This congregate setting differs substantially from any other state-run residential school. Both the Tennessee School for the Deaf and School for the Blind are residential, yes, but students maintain connection to their families and communities by returning home on the weekends and during school breaks. No such maintenance of family contact or even parent participation on the board is contemplated in the bill. Ms. Jamil, please finish up your comments. Those schools are also staffed with one professional for every three students, and they specialize in serving one particular population. While that cannot be said for this proposal. Thank you. Mr. Pendergrass is here to answer questions. Mr. Pendergrass, introduce yourself and give us your department. And if, if you wish to make any opening comments, you will. Otherwise, the committee will have questions for you later. Uh, yes, sir. Hayden Pendergrass with the Tennessee Public Charter School Commission. Uh, just want to uh, mention we, we don't have any concerns with the bill as drafted. We had worked with the Speaker's Office last year on a similar piece of legislation and uh, don't have any concerns with the, the new amended version of the bill, but I'd be happy to take any questions related to it. Thank you. Members, you've heard the speakers. If you have questions, uh, Representative Johnson, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think that last thing that you just said really spoke to me that um, there's no going home on the weekends or family or going back to your community. I just met with some uh, school for the deaf, deaf kids and and uh, just a couple weeks ago, and, and they talked about going home and how important that was for them. So you're saying that's not in the bill at all? Recognize. Turn your mic on, please. It's not contemplated in the bill as written, and I think that raises a really important point about congregate settings generally and how often they are, uh, youth in those settings are at higher risk for abuse. And up to 85% of abuse cases go unreported in congregate settings. And one of the things that prevents that is contact with family and being able to tell family when abuse or neglect is happening in a facility like that. Follow up, Representative Johnson. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I guess, you know, that's a big part of it. I know some of those, some of those um, um, schools that are, that are opened, at, you know, overnight, residential schools that we see problems with sexual abuse we see problems uh with abuse and and that other concern for mine is children of abuse that might be considered at risk in with folks who have been abusers that sort of thing is incredibly frightening to me like we're talking about mixing groups that should not be mixed and putting them together with no ability to to go home anything like that. So is there anything in, in this bill that says you'll be close to your home? There's nothing. Uh, you're recognized. There's nothing that says you'll be close to your home. And you do raise a good point about the commingling of different groups of young people. Um, you know, youth in DCS custody are kept separate. Dependent or neglected youth are not kept in the same facilities as youth who've been adjudicated delinquent. And so the fact that we wouldn't do that in one setting, but we are contemplating commingling populations in this setting um, is concerning. And I do think it also, you know, there was one, um, the sponsor raised the issue that nonprofits may provide the housing for these residential schools. But if we look at what has happened with some of our unlicensed, unregulated nonprofit housing in the context of transitional houses, it's really concerning to think about, um, you know, 
offering housing through nonprofits without the support and guidance that a nonprofit needs in that type of setting. Thank you. Uh, members, uh, Representative Lafferty, you recognize? Question, question for the, the guest. How about now? We got my we got there microphone go. working. I think I broke mine. Uh, yeah, question for the ladies up there. You both touched on the importance of families uh, in these kids' lives, and I couldn't agree with you more. Um, one of you even mentioned, uh, I think you said, replacing families with schools. Uh, schools are, in this state, our public schools are operated by the government. Uh, so government schools taking the place of the family. What, what's the difference in that and when we give funds, give dollars to un, unwed mothers and pay the, pay the mother to keep a father out of a house? Could, could you guys square that up for me, please? Representative Lafferty, let's let's stay on the bill, please. My apologies, Mr. Chair. That's a that was my only question. I, I'll pass. Thank you, Representative uh, Martin. Are you moving to go back into session? We have a motion to go back into session. Any objections? Seeing none. Thank you for being here. We are back in session. We are back on the bill. Next on my list to speak uh, before I call on him. Uh, Mr. Sponsor, do you have any comment, closing comments? No, I just asked for a positive recommendation. All right. Uh, Representative Reedy, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And call a question on the bill. The question has been moved. Do we have uh, any objections? Seeing none, we are voting on sending House Bill 2922 to finance ways and means. All in favor, indicate by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, nay. No. no. Ayes have it. If you wish to be recorded as a no, please have your name uh, to the clerk. Thank you, Chairman and Committee. Members, we're on item number three, House Bill 785. Motion. We have a motion and a second. Uh, Chairman White, you're recognized for an explanation of your bill, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Committee. Do we need to get an amendment in order? Or are we okay? Yeah, amendment's traveling with us, sir. Oh, uh, great. Thank you. Uh, if you will, Chairman, let me kind of give the committee uh, the gist of where this bill came from. Started working on this a couple of years, years ago. As I travel around the state, uh, talking to superintendents, mayors, chambers of commerce, one of the, uh, the biggest issues they, they always brought up was, hey, we just don't have enough affordable or available child care. Well, I started thinking about that and combine that with working in the education committee. We also have issues with early childhood literacy, right? Third grade retention that we've worked on for a number of years and things of that nature. So we begin to think of what about this concept? What if we were to marry the two? We have what is known as Tennessee Promise, which comes out of our, our, our lottery funds. But on the front end, what if we were to combine the two and call it Promising Futures, where children that we have to have daycare before they get to pre-K or kindergarten, where we'd have a, a, a child care the child care program combined with an early ch childhood literacy program that would help our, uh, our parents around the state also help our workforce. As you know, one of the big issues, child care is so expensive. If it's available, they say right now the average child care cost could be as much as 35,000 a year. And so without affordable, available child care in our state, it keeps many of our uh, family members out of the workforce, which hurts our, hurt, does hurt our workforce. So what this bill does is called Promising Futures. It, it is uh, early childhood literacy combined with, uh, like Tennessee Promise, combined with, uh, with child care. It's a last dollar scholarship for early learning programs like the Tennessee Promise is available to our, into our higher ed. It's for children prior to kindergarten with household incomes up to 100% of the median state income which is right around for a family of four by 88,000. Uh, we propose that the funding would come through, it's a pilot program of four years, the funding would come through our, our sports betting at five million a year for four years in a pilot program. And as I said, the bill will help to tackle two major problems, early childhood literacy combined with uh, child care affordability and availability. Uh, uh, and as we have stated, uh, this bill would encourage more child care programs to use instructional practice that are proven to support early childhood literacy and, and learning. Uh, the program was started as a, as a pilot, and uh, 
that is the gist of the bill. Technically, the rulemaking would have to go through the Department of Human Services, which we've been working with them, and, and they are, are working with us as we move move forward uh, for because they have the child care programs and with the Department of Education on the early childhood literacy. So that's the gist of the bill, Mr. Chairman and committee. Members, you've heard an explanation. We have questions of the sponsor. Representative Akeem, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it sounds like a wonderful program. <clears throat> I'm, I'm trying to understand how this pilot, how broad it is. Is this going to be in one grand division? Or are we going to have it spread out through the state uh, to sort of uh, get a view of, of how effective something like this can be? You recognize, Mr. Sponsor? Well, thank you, uh, Reps. Like most things we do, we, we're starting as a pilot. It is, sta it is statewide with a $5 million cap. Uh, most things, uh, funding is an issue, so we kind of want to start at maybe a, a point where we could maybe get that much funding. So it is statewide, but it's, and it's capped at the, like I said, the medium income of, for Family Four, which is, I think, approximately maybe a little bit off 88000 just to get it going, there, there are a lot. There's always a lot of moving parts in, in this. We we have childcare. With DHS does a fabulous job on that, uh, but we would like to take Tennessee to a position where if you go be in childcare in your early years before you ever get to pre-K, if we had some type of early childhood literacy program instruction during that time, that way we still, as, as we know, even a lot of times kids get to kindergarten, they're still they're still way behind. Uh, we, we don't have a universal pre-K program. We have a volunteer pre-K program, which means it's not uh, statewide and available in every area. So this is just the means maybe that we could continue to uh, tackle two issues with, uh, with one particular piece of legislation. Follow-up, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I think I heard you clearly, but I just want to be clear on it. Uh, the pilot will be statewide and that uh, it's, is it those persons who work in the child care piece or is it just families in general who could benefit from this? You recognize Mr. Sponsor? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Right. It is a statewide program open to uh, those who meet the family medium incomes. Uh, they have to, there, there are some other things in here, uh, details that uh, they have to be uh, Tennessee residents and all, all the above in order to qualify. But it is open to those who would qualify in those, those guidelines of uh, medium income. Some people have asked, you know, could you make it larger? We say, well, let's see if we can get something going and get a fiscal note we can pass and then go from there after the pilot program. Just one last, last follow-up. Yes, please. Sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it sounds like a great program and something we need to at least have a pilot on so we can measure uh, the potential of such a program. And I thank you for bringing it, sir. The Representative Johnson, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I see that there is a work requirement for the parent of at least 30 hours a week. Is that correct? You're recognized, Mr. Sponsor. That is correct. Thank you. Follow up. Um, I guess my other question is um, the Tennessee, does that include um, non-documented students as well? You're recognized, sir. My understanding being a Tennessee resident, it, it would be a... Uh, person who is a U.S. citizen. Yes, it, therefore that makes them a Tennessee resident by law. Well, we, we have a lot of undocumented immigrants who are, reside in Tennessee. Do you have, please wait to be recognized. you have a question for that? Yeah, from what I understand it is, it says in the bill they are to be a Tennessee resident. So, I would I would still hold by the that you do have to be a resident. What what is the definition of a Tennessee resident? Uh, that's a lawyer question. <laughs> my have to ask legal. That. Yeah, that's it. Uh, unless you're asking to go out of session, we'll we'll continue down the list for other questions. Okay, uh, Representative Jones, you're recognized. I have one more that's pretty important. If I could just get this one more little. All right, little you're more. recognized for one more follow up. Thank you. Um, where's the program coming from? You know, um, when we're talking about young kids, you're not, you don't teach them to read. That's inappropriate. So these programs you're talking about, I feel like 
you're building the plane while it's in the air. I don't feel like this is a plan. This is an idea that needs to be a plan before it becomes a bill, in my view. Where is the um, this curriculum or where's that going to come from? You recognize Mr. Sponsor? And, and thank you. And like I say, we've been trying to build the plan, the plan for two years. Uh, that would come through the rulemaking of DOE, who does the literacy part, and then working through DHS, the literacy part of the uh, child care part. Like I say, once we get something that we could get going, then the rulemaking, we can work a lot of those details. And that has been the challenge of this is moving forward. But we think a good concept needs to move forward so that we can get to those specifics. Representative Jones, you recognize? Pass. Uh, Representative Kumar, you recognize? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Chairman White, for bringing this. I think it's, as you said, it's putting two of our needs together to create a program. Kindly elaborate a little bit on the funding mechanism. You recognize, sir? Thank you. In this particular bill, as you know, Tennessee Promise, uh, that comes out of our lottery funds, right? Hope Scholarship, Tennessee Promise, out of our, out of our lottery funds. A couple of years ago, we passed the legislation. We started the sports betting. Uh, from what I understand, that's already taken in. It's only been in operation, what, two years, a little bit more. It's already taken in about $70 million a year. So we thought, uh, since we spend a lot of money on Tennessee Promise for the higher ed, on the other end of the spectrum, the early childhood uh, care, could we not spend some on the early childhood years to, to get them ready for, for kindergarten and, and pre-K? So the funding mechanism, we're asking for five for four years as a pilot program, five million a year out of that sports betting dollars. Follow Thank up, you. Sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Balsu, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Chairman White, just following up on part of our earlier discussion, as I read your bill, and in particular, Section 49-1-111, subpart D, it requires that to be eligible, a participant must be a citizen of this state. So that would, in turn, uh, require that someone have a lawful immigration status. Would you agree? I would. <laughs> you recognize, sir. Uh, thank you, Chairman, and and I I would that uh, could be a legal question, but that's the way it is normally interpreted. Yes. Follow up, sir. Seeing none, do we have other questions of our sponsor, Representative McCain? You recognized? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, would this apply to public and charter schools or private schools? Uh, who, who does it apply to? Follow up, sir. I'm sorry. You recognized? This falls outside of that scope. This is a child care program that, that like D, DHS already has child care programs. But what we're trying to do is put together a program where child care and early childhood literacy are combined through working with uh, DOE, Department of Education. So this falls outside the scope of, of school. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Charlie Littleton, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll call for previous question. Previous question has been called. Any objections? Seeing none, we are voting on sending House Bill 2678 to finance ways and means. All in favor indicate by saying aye. aye. All opposed, nay. No. Ayes have it. If you wish to be recorded as a no, make sure the clerk has your name. Members, next on our list is item number four, House Bill 2678 by Chairman White. We have a motion and a second. You're recognized, sir. Thank you, Chairman, committee, and appreciate the opportunity to present another bill before you that been now that this one we've been working on for three years. Uh, about three years ago, I went to uh, was down in uh, my hometown of Memphis over the University of Memphis. Where they have what is known as a campus school. That's been in operation since 1912 for 112 years. They have three schools. They have the elementary, the middle, and, and the high school. And as we was talking to them, this is during while we were working on our third grade retention and uh, our learning loss, and started talking to them, and we were told that they have 87% proficiency in reading, and this is in a state where we're at 34% average or a little bit more now, uh, or also in a community where we have like 23%. So I began to talk to them, and I says, can y'all duplicate this? Uh, and right now, the campus schools, this has been around for 112 years. They currently operate it with, with a contract with the Memphis Shelby County School System, but they're limited to 1,000 students. So what we desire to do in this legislation is create them and make them an LEA, 
a, a local education associated, a, a school district called the uh, University of Memphis Campus Schools Innovative School District to let them take that model and continue over the years to expand that and put that that model in, in, in place. It's been a very effective model. Like I said, for they've been around 112 years. They have a, a great uh, uh, formula going. And if I mentioned this, the university schools had the highest pass rate in English, science, social studies, and were a close second in mathematics. All three schools earned an A in our letter grade this past this past fall, and they have they are they are the highest performing schools in the state of Tennessee, all across the state. So I went to them and several other members, and we said, "Can you duplicate this?" And so we've been working on this for a while, and so that's what the gist of this bill this bill would do. And with that, I would appreciate a favorable uh, motion. Thank you, Mr. Susan. Before I recognize anyone for questions, I need to correct a clerical error. The previous bill was House Bill 785, which goes out to finance, ways, and means. Thank you. We're now on uh, House Bill 2678. You've heard an explanation of the bill. Do we have any questions of the sponsor? Vice Chairman Reedy, recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Call the question on the bill. The question has been called. Do we have objections? Seeing none, we are voting on sending House Bill 2678 to finance, ways, and means. All in favor, indicate by saying aye. aye. All opposed, nay. Eyes have it. If you wish to be recorded as no, see the clerk. Bill moves out to finance, ways, and means. Thank you, committee. Next on our agenda is item number five, House Bill 2610 by, by Representative Garrett. We have a motion in a second. Representative Garrett, you're recognized on your bill, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I assume the amendment's traveling. The amendment's with it, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for that clarification. House Bill 2610, as amended, simply asks the Attorney General, along with our Human Rights Commission, to get together and see if it's feasible for the Human Rights Commission to be under the Attorney General's office. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll be glad to take any questions, but that's all that House Bill 2610, as amended, does. Thank you. Uh, members, I have on my list uh, Representative Jones. You're recognized, sir. Thank you. Uh, to the sponsor, are you familiar with what um, acts and policies the Human Rights Commission are, is supposed to enforce. Can you give us some examples? You recognize sponsor? The Human Rights Commission does any acts of discrimination as such, anyone that may be discriminated against for housing. You know, that's one example, but there's many things that the that falls on the purview of the Human Rights Commission. Follow up, sir. Housing, um, see, thank you. Housing, public accommodations. Uh, the Human Rights Commission was created in some form in 1963. So it's an over 60 year old commission um, to enforce the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Can you explain to us why you think that the Human Rights Commission should be placed under, under the Attorney General's office when the Attorney General has shown time and time again that he is hostile to civil and human rights when it comes to communities of color, when it comes to the LGBTQ community, and when it comes to um, anybody who um, does not look like yourself? Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Sponsor, you're recognized. Thank you for that uh, question, Representative Jones. And that's exactly what this piece of legislation will do once the report is finalized and due back from the Human Rights Commission by January 1st, 2025. So I'll be looking forward to see what that report uh, does. Uh, last follow-up, please, sir. Can you explain where this idea came from to put this under the Attorney General? Because the initial bill was to put it under without a study. Um, did this... Did, I mean, is there, has there been an issue with the Human Rights Commission as it exists now? It's been in place for over 60 years. So why now do you want to see it placed under the Attorney General's office? You recognize, Mr. Sponsor? Again, Representative Jones, there should be absolutely no discrimination whatsoever in this particular state, in this particular country, and ever. No one should be discriminated because of the way they look like, what they believe in, or anything whatsoever. There should be absolutely no discrimination whatsoever. So... What this bill, bill potentially does is see if it's there, if it's feasible for this commission to be under the purview of our attorney general, whose sole job is is defend the citizens of the state of Tennessee when they are unlawfully pursued or someone has broken the law in the face of whatever they're facing, right? And so this so will see if we can have the most the person that is deemed to enforce our laws, to bring those laws in front of the court system, can do that in the attorney general's office, the highest division in our state to enforce our particular piece of legislation that we pass here. So all this is looking at is seeing, is that feasible? Will it work? Will it stop, prevent those that feel they've been that's discriminated against in order to stop it? That's all this particular piece of legislation does, to see if it's feasible. Uh, 
we're running short on time, sir. Let me let me recognize someone else. If we have time, we'll come back. Representative Akeem, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it, it appears that what is being done is removing any independence from that committee and putting it under an administration, I'm gonna say representative, and uh, I guess the decisions should be those that are uh, looked at as being fair and balanced. And if we're gonna put it under an administrative person, are we, I, in my view, we're removing that independence. And I think that's something that's needed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You recognize Mr. Sponsor? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I think that the Attorney General's Office and the Human Rights Commission have heard your concerns, and that could be part of the report uh, that is produced come January 1, 2025, to see if there's a level of uh, any type of uh, these agencies acting where it can't be independent. I would argue otherwise, but I think that'll come when the bill is proposed uh, next session, if the whatever the report uh, deems necessary. So I'm looking forward to those uh, to that debate at that time. Representative Johnson, you recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just really quickly, um, what was the impetus for this? What was done wrong uh, over these sixty years that that again, all of a sudden, we've got to make this change? What um, what was the impetus for this change? You recognize, Mr. Sponsor. Well, right now, the bill in front of you is not changing anything. It's just looking at the feasibility of transferring this commission under the attorney general. Follow up, please. So that would tell me somebody wants to make a change. And so, again, why are we discussing it? Why are we discussing a change? You recognize Mr. Sponsor. And I think that can certainly be discussed of what this is going to look like once this has been looked upon to see the various advantages and the various disadvantages. So I think your question is a little bit premature. And if, if this should come back from the Attorney General that this is suggested from working with the Human Rights Commission and the Attorney General's Office, I'll, that debate can take place at that time. But right now, all this piece of legislation that's in front of you is looking at that to see. It could come back and say, there's nothing needed, it needs to stay where it is. It could come back and say, it needs to be here. We feel we can do it better. Who knows what that report might be? But I think it's worth looking into this because people should not be discriminated against for any purpose in this state. And I want to make sure that's not going to happen. Representative Jones, last follow-up, please. Thank you. I'll put in two parts. This is my last one. First of all, sponsor, you still haven't answered the question. What is meriting even studying the issue? Has the Human Rights Commission done something not satisfactory to you? Do you not agree with how they've been enforcing um, anti-discrimination policies? Why are we even looking at bringing this under another agency when it's an independent commission. Governor Frank Clement created it that way in 1963. It has worked for over 60 years. Why are we even studying putting it under the Attorney General? And do you believe that the Attorney General has been active in discrimination in this case? You know, a lot of, a lot of Tennesseans who um, are black and brown may feel discriminated when the Attorney General files lawsuits going after companies that ban discrimination in their policies um, in, with, um, you know, environmental social governance policies. Some people may feel that the attorney general discriminated against transgender people when he went after their medical records. I mean, so why are we putting it under attorney general who's been hostile to human rights? And so those are my two questions. You're recognized very quickly. And I think all your questions will be addressed at the time the report comes back from the attorney general. Members, uh, we are running short on time. Uh, without objection, we are going to vote on sending House Bill 2610 to calendar and rules. All in favor indicate by saying aye. aye. All opposed, nay. No. Bill moves out with eyes having it. And uh, members, we're going to have to roll the remainder of our calendar to the next meeting uh, without objection. All bills roll to the next calendar. Uh, the chair will entertain a motion to adjourn. Non debatable. We're adjourned. Members, as a reminder, we have to be on the House floor in 15 minutes.